September 2nd, 1945, uh, we came uh, globally into the declaration that World War II had ended. And of course, as that was coming to a close, there was uh, an ongoing uh, uncovering of atrocities that occurred. There was a Holocaust that had happened against the Jews and many others of the region. And as that uh, became to be truth, there was eyewitnesses and there was evidence and there was photographs and there was material possessions and all this that pointed to the reality that these horrible things had happened. And in 2006, David Irving was arrested as a Holocaust denier. See, in Austria and other European uh, areas, there is uh, a law, basically, that you, you cannot deny this happened. They really want to make sure that people don't forget what really occurred. And in 2006, David was sent to prison. I think he spent about three years there. But despite all of the evidence before him that points directly to a real, actual event, he refuses to believe it. But what surprises me is he's willing to go to jail for that. My question today, I guess a little bit I'm thinking is, we're going to talk about the truth of Jesus that's found in the Bible that we've seen and have evidence of. And the question is, we have evidence of this also. And the question is, does it show up in our lives? You know, there's people out there that they look at God's word and they say, ah, creation, that, that's, that's just a myth. It's just an accident. So people refuse to believe there's creation despite the complexity of our bodies and our minds and our eyes. And just, just look at how fascinating the human body is, let alone when you walk outside and you see creation on full display. But people want to deny that evidence. In fact, there are people that now are continuing to push this idea of a flat earth theory. And it's gaining a little bit of traction in those who, in my mind, have lost their marbles. The evidence is overwhelming. There is a round sphere and Bible speaks of it as a sphere, which is so cool. And then of course, there's those who have the birds aren't real idea that all the birds that are flying are really in operation to spy on you. Despite the evidence, they refuse to believe. And so for us, however, we have evidence in front of us of a true story of a real God based in his creation, based on what he did for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and by his word, which continually points truth after truth after truth. In fact, there's an interesting thing to think about. Around the world, 84% of the world population, so it's roughly now about seven and a half billion people. So 84% roughly believe there is something that happens after we die, whether that's a Christian view and that's uh, how they got this information from this study in 2015. I'm not sure who they're really lumping into Christians, but, but they say that 2.4 billion people believe there's, or 2.3 billion, excuse me, that there's some kind of life after death. And then the Muslims believe something after death and unaffiliated, unaffiliated people have some kind of view of something beyond or Hindus and Buddhists and Jews. And just there's lots and lots. And often in our culture, at least here in America, specifically in Oregon, it feels like the loudest voice is that there's nothing, that that's it. But you're not alone if you at least wrestle with the concept that there is something that happens after we take our last earthly breath. We're in the middle of the I Am series. We've been focusing on the statements of Jesus, the declarations of his deity, and what it means that he is who he says he is. And so we've walked through the I Am statement that says Jesus is before all things happen before Abraham, I am. And we've looked at his, he's the, the bread of life and he is the light of the world and he's living water. And then last week we heard about him being the good shepherd and the door. Like there is all of these statements. And as you've heard perhaps and listened, or as you're listening today, the key question I wanna focus in on as I walk you through perhaps kind of a mental challenge is this. Do you believe what you believe you believe? 
Let's say that again. Do you believe what you believe you believe? In other words, if you believe there is a creator, does it show up as evidence in the way you live? You see, your belief will be shown in your behaviors. How you live is fully on display as a root of what you believe. So do you believe what you believe you believe? Jesus' statement today comes out of John chapter 11. So if you want to open to to John 11, he, he makes this declaration, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And many of you may be familiar with the story that occurs in John 11. So I want to I give you the premise of the story. So if you want to take some notes on your own, feel free to do that. But, but mainly just listen to this because it's important. John chapter 11 is the story that many are familiar with of the death and then Jesus bringing back to life Lazarus. And so the story opens up that Jesus hears about his friend Lazarus is not doing well. In fact, he's most likely going to die. And of course, he's with the disciples and and. For whatever reason, and Jesus unfolds this later, they didn't just rush in. And I think the heart behind it is Jesus said, I'm going to do something powerful. And I'm going to use this moment where there can be no no, no, uh, confusion of the fact that this Lazarus, my friend, will be dead. In fact, you'll find in the story that he waits and it's four days later after his death that he goes to the tomb. He's and there's, there's, it's very clear. Well, in the story also, we have Mary and Martha. See, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, they're a family. And Mary is the one that you read about where she pours perfume on Jesus' feet and, and dries his feet with this as, a, as an act of worship. And then Martha, the sister. And, and so they have a clear uh, belief of following as they follow Jesus. They're close friends. They're family, basically. Clearly, they love one another. And and so in the story, we see this Martha comes out to greet Jesus. Mary stays in the house and Martha runs out to Jesus. And of course, she is troubled. Like, don't you get, like, he's dead. So so he approaches. And in this moment, I want to bring you into the story right there, into uh, verse 25. Because here's the interaction that I want to focus on today is specific to the interaction of Martha and Jesus. And I want you to relate a little bit with Martha. Before we go into that, let's take one more pause and, and think about the heart of Jesus. Jesus is not only a friend of Lazarus, but you're going to find that all famous quote that most people can memorize, that, that longest verse of the Bible where Jesus wept. <laughs> oh man, I've memorized scripture today. But the heart behind it is this, Jesus, in his full understanding of the authority that God has given him, weeps and mourns with those around him. He knows what he's about to even do. He's going to raise Lazarus back to life. Kind of a disappointment for Lazarus, in my opinion, because later on, you find out that the Jews want to kill Jesus and Lazarus because they're really concerned about, there's there's way too much going on here. But don't miss the moment. Even though Jesus knows the outcome, he weeps with them. He doesn't flaunt it in their face and say, you guys are idiots. Don't you get it? Don't you understand who I am? He he weeps with them. He mourns with them. And then he, of course, reveals that he has power. And he raises Lazarus and calls him out of the tomb. It's a powerful story. And I encourage you to walk through this this week. Go through the devotions, walk through this story again. But let's go into verse 25 and really press in to a conversation. So here's here's what happens. This is Martha runs up, Lord, Lord, like, don't you know what's going on? She says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I mean, she's grieving, like, where were you? And then she says this, but I know even now God will give you whatever you ask. But Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. This, it's a funny conversation and I read a lot into it. I don't know exactly how she responded. I don't know really how Jesus responded in the way he used his voice. But it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. It's like, um, hello, he's going to rise again. And she's like, no, 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 I know. He'll rise again at the last day of the resurrection. I get that. And he goes, no, 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 no. Martha, Martha, Martha. If you're a Brady Bunch fan, that would have been Marcia, but but Jesus presses in, Martha, 
I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. And even though they die, and whoever lives believing in me will never die. And then he asks the question, do you believe this? He asks that question. Do you believe this? You see, Martha is waiting for an event. The last day this resurrection will happen. And if you were here, this could have happened and, and all these things. But I know, I know that God is with you and I know that God can do all kinds of things through you and, and I get it. And Jesus says, no, Martha, listen. You talk about the last resurrection, the day that when all will rise. No, I am the resurrection. It all happens in my power. I am the one. All life is in me. In fact, he says, look, whoever believes in me will live. And even though their bodies will die, they will live. They will never die. Their bodies will fade away, but they will live. And, and then he asked the question, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Remember last week, Pastor Jason, he, he referred to the moment Jesus is talking about he's the good shepherd, but he makes a statement. He says, I have all authority to lay my life down and raise it up. And he says this again to Martha, he's saying, look, do you believe that I have that authority? I am the resurrection. I am it. I'm the source of it. And I am the source of all things. But let's back up for a moment because I was fascinated in studying and preparing and the amount of times that I've read through this, I just often brush through stories because I've read the story before and I kind of get to the end and yeah, he raises Lazarus from the dead. That's so cool. But let's back up for a second and look at the conversation and look at the words that were used. I, I found this kind of fascinating. Martha says to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Did you notice that word? She says, I know. Have you ever found yourself saying, oh, I know. I know God's got this. But actually in the back of your mind, you're wringing your hands going, oh man, I hope this works out. Oh no, I know that God will provide the bills this month, but you, you're frantic and looking around going, I wonder what we have to sell this month. Or I know that there'll be plenty of food, but then really you're kind of looking at it going, I'm not sure we're going to make it. Oh, but I know. And then, and interestingly enough, she says it again. I know he'll rise again at the last day. You see, Martha is so focused on the present, she does not necessarily think of it as a future also. She's so focused on the present, she's missing the fact that the present is now and the future is now. But all she sees is, oh, I know someday. I know someday. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm here now. Like the resurrection is right here standing in front of you. I just think it's a fascinating way that oftentimes we do this. And, I, and I, maybe I should ask for a moment and pause. What are the things that you think you believe? I think I believe that. Oh, no, no, I know that. Yeah, I know God's got it. But what really, when it really comes down to it, when you're really face to face with the crisis or the tragedy or the, the doubt or uncertainty, do you say things like, oh, I know God's got this? Or do you say in confidence, I believe God is at work? That's tough. I haven't mastered that. There's lots of, lots of times I find myself in that moment going, oh, I, I know God's got this, but I need to maybe go back and say, but do I really believe it? Do I really, do I really believe this? Well, let's just clarify whether or not you believe what you believe. Do you believe what you believe you believe? So let's go to the first one is the statement is that Jesus is the resurrection. Do you believe that? Do you believe that not only that he was real in the flesh on earth, God in representation in man form, this amazing gift, who then sacrificed his life for you. Do you believe that? And then defeated death and sin and proving that rose again. Do you believe that? See, in 1 Corinthians, you might remember this from the Easter season, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says it this way, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. So everything we talk about is foundational to this statement that Jesus makes. He says, I am the resurrection and I'm gonna prove it. So do you believe that Jesus did 
resurrect from the dead. Because everything is foundational on that moment. His death was critical, but his resurrection was final. That was it. That was the moment when he says, no more. From this day forward, all of the past is done. All the sacrifices that were pointing to me are over. Today, it is final. And on the cross, he even said, it's finished. That's it. It's time to move forward. And see, we have this problem. If we don't believe that, then what Paul says, first of all, if it's not true, the, the apostle Paul, then we're, we're dead anyways. So Martha, do you believe it? I'm the resurrection and the life. See, our problem like Martha is we live in this world and we have the view of a very short time frame, which for some of us feels like it will never end and others can't wait for it to end, right? Like, when am I going to get there? But just think about the phases. I can't wait till I can walk. I can't wait till I graduate high school. I can't wait till I graduate college. I can't wait till I have kids. I can't wait till the kids move out. I can't wait till I retire. I, now I, don't, I want to wait a little longer now. We're so focused on this. And time and time again, Jesus keeps pointing out, listen, you're always focused on food. So I said on the bread of life is a symbolic reality that I am food for your soul. I have an eternal perspective, the living water that, remember the woman at the well that I spoke on this? Go look, go look at that story. She's all, oh, if only I had this water, I wouldn't have to fill these buckets anymore. He's like, no, 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 this is about your life. This, I'm life. I'm living water. Come, come to me. We have such a, a, a simplified view. And Jesus keeps pushing and saying, I'm going to use all these earthly analogies to point to a spiritual reality. It's out here. You've got to get it. And so you've heard this, maybe you've heard this statement before, seeing is believing. Which is, it's a good statement. I mean, yeah, if, of course, in our world, I think it's even harder these days. There's so much technology, it's even hard to believe what you see. Don't watch the news for very long because you're going to be a skeptic about everything. Seeing is believing, but Jesus flips it. In fact, there's this moment where Thomas, one of the disciples, Jesus had died and he hadn't resurrected yet. And Thomas is like, unless I touch him and see him, I won't believe. And of course, Jesus appears and says, here, touch here and touch here. And he's like, oh, I get it. But Jesus takes it and says, no, I'm going to tell you something. Believing is what it takes to see. Believe in me and you will have eternal life. Believe that I am the resurrection and the life. Believe that I am living water and I am the source of all life. And I am the light of the world. Believe in me and then you will see what life truly looks like. From the moment you receive Christ, the resurrection in you has begun. Your eternal life begins the moment you accept Jesus. And he says, don't live dead. <laughs> don't live dying, live alive. And so I wanna have you evaluate with me four key statements, four thoughts for today. And this is where I hope you'll wrestle. Is there evidence of your belief in your life? Is there evidence? Are you seeing your belief? So here's the first statement. Because of the resurrection, excuse me, I can live a forgiven, focused life. I can live a forgiven, focused life. Think about this. It says, Jesus says, look, because I am the resurrection, because you believe in me, you no longer are under the penalty of sin. You're forgiven. It's no longer hanging over you. Do you live with that understanding or do you continue to hold on to your past and say, oh, how could you possibly forgive and love me, God? And then you're not living to the fullest. You're not focused on the freedom. You're focused on the bondage of your past. He says, no, you can live a forgiven, focused life. Not only that, but the power of sin over you is now no longer at work. Jesus says, look, you guys, you're now free. You're not you're not restricted anymore. And then, of course, the greatest hope of my forgiven, focused life is I no longer in eternity will live with the presence of sin. It's gone. Man, that's the gospel. The gospel of Jesus is, look, I've defeated all of it. Your past, forgiven. 
your future, no more power over you. You have authority with me to, to defeat this. And then, of course, the future, it's gone. Huh. I want to live in that reality. I want the future now. <laughs> I, want to, I want to get out of this world. I'm so tired of the pain that we see. I'm so tired of it. So do you live free or do you continue to limit what God is doing in your life? Let me ask it this way. Are you seeing the belief that you're forgiven? Are you experiencing that as belief and truth in your life? And do people go, man, I know who you were, but you are different and you have life in you. Next is that because Jesus is the resurrection, I can have a purposeful life. I'm having some fun with words today. A purposeful. Not only do you enter into a purpose, a mission that matters, an eternal mission with Jesus in reaching the nations, but do you understand that you have importance in your community with you? That people in your community, you have a purpose to be full of life around them so they would see God on display. You have a purpose. And are you living that purpose full and welling up in you? Do you realize in that statement that we have made at Family Church that we are to be people helping people find and follow Jesus, that that is our purpose? And that it should be the guiding direction to say, God, I want to be so involved in your purposes. And he says, look, because I'm the resurrection, you have a purpose. Come join me. Let's go. Let's live a life together. You're not doing it for me. I'm with you during this. Jesus says, look, don't worry. I'm with you. All authority in heaven and earth is given to me and I will be with you. Are you living with that mindset that he's with you every day? Or are you living as if he's far away? Are you seeing a purposeful life? Are you seeing that belief? The third one is that because Jesus is the resurrection, I can live a spirit-fired life. I love that picture in Acts. It's like the, the, the Holy Spirit descended on them like fire. The cool thing about fire is you can't sit very still if it's underneath you. <laughs> You're going to have to get moving. But I want you to hear this. This is an, an incredible truth that, that I think we need to press into more, and I don't have time today. But perhaps you should go read Galatians 5. Because here's what Jesus said. He said, look, before he departed earth, he says, I am sending a helper, the Holy Spirit. And here's the deal. The Holy Spirit is going to indwell in you and give you the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, think about this. That the Holy Spirit comes into you and you receive love and joy and peace and peace, excuse me, and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And all of that has been given to you. And he says, now unpack it all with me. Watch and see. If you pursue me with the Spirit, I will reveal in you these gifts. So there's a great inventory. Are you experiencing the love of God today? And are you expressing love to others around you? Are you aware of and experiencing God's gentleness and, and his patience and his faithfulness? Are you experiencing that? And then are people seeing that in you, the way you interact, the way you press in, the way you love others? Are you seeing that belief? You see, the Holy Spirit comes in you as soon as you receive Christ. The resurrection of your soul has occurred. Your eternity is now before you and life can be lived to the fullest and you can live a spirit-fired life on fire. The other thing I love about fire is it's warm and inviting. That's the Holy Spirit. It's not cold and not off-putting. He just says, God, just pursue me. I want to show you this. I want to show you that I'm active in your life. The last one I'm going to focus in on is that I can live a hope 
hope-fueled life. A hope-fueled life. You know that the biblical definition of hope is not what most of us think of. Most of us wring our hands and make statements, oh, oh I hope this happens. <laughs> Oh, I hope so. I hope this, this comes true. I hope I get that, or I hope uh, this person's okay, and, and I hope, and I hope, and I hope, and that's not what I'm talking about, because that's not all that much fuel. In fact, it usually puts me in reverse. My mind goes backwards farther into denial and doubt, <laughs> and, and this is the idea. Hope is that I have a confident expectation of what God said he will do will come true. That even in the crisis, I have a perspective that says, man, this really is a hard journey, but I have hope today. And I don't want to be insensitive to the reality of a tragedy this week. And I just think of the loss of these, these children in Texas, this murders that occurred. And I think of the the, the family members who on that day found out, I just, my heart is broken. I can't help but think, my personality anyways, is I get really mad really fast when I see these, these things happen. And, and if I don't have a hope-fueled life, what I often do is I go into fix-it mode, lash-out mode, anger mode, all those modes come out, and I'm no longer living, looking at the life through the lens of hope. I actually sort of get shocked and stunted and I get pushed back away from what I'm called to do and I start to go into my fleshly response. And I see it in the news, I see it in people's responses and I get it. And it's hard. But I'm so grateful that I have hope that even in the midst of this horrible time and as we mourn with those parents and mourn the loss and the devastation in this school, that we have hope beyond this, that God will make good, that he is in control. And even though it feels like it's chaos, I, he's in control and I have hope. And so I hope that you have hope today. That is, is a tough, tough time. But I know I can live a hope-fueled life. And so as I daily pursue these beliefs, I believe that God will, will demonstrate visibly that you will see your belief. So I just want to close here for now. I just want to take this time and just say, look at these four areas and, and evaluate this week. Are you seeing a life in Christ? Are you seeing the resurrection and the life of Christ playing out in your day? Are you seeing the fruit of the Spirit developing? It is not a one and done. This is a process. But maybe today there's something that you need to press into. That you need to say, yeah, I do believe it, but I don't see evidence in my life. God, I'm going to go to you and say, God, help me in my unbelief. Although I say I know, help me believe. I'm going to release to our campuses. I love you guys. Look forward to seeing you soon. All right, thank you guys for sticking around. And, um, and I hope that you could take some time maybe even, I would just encourage you to pause uh, at the end of this, or even if you want to stop now and just pray, just spend some time praying over the families. I've seen some negativity on Facebook about just prayer is ineffective. And I say, no, the enemy wants you to say your prayers aren't worth anything, but I, I think it would be great if you would take some time and pray over the families in Texas, pray for your family, pray over those in your community, those who are uh, perhaps have experienced tragedy like this before and it shocks them again. But here's what I wanna challenge you with today. Here's the question. What do you believe? What, what today did you hear that you believe? Maybe just make a list. Yes, I believe this. Yes, I believe this. Yes, I believe this. And then ask yourself the deeper question. Do you really believe it or did you just know it? No, I know, I know, I know about the Holy Spirit, but are you seeing the evidence. So the, the second part of it, it's kind of, I have to say them together is this. So what will you do about it? What will you do as you look at what you believe, what will you do with that information? If you truly believe that you're forgiven, what will you do as a result of that belief? How will it look in your life? Because my guess is there's maybe there's a moment where you go, I really do believe it, but I'm really struggling with this. 
or I really do believe I'm forgiven, but I struggle at forgiving others. Maybe the do part this week is to practice forgiveness of others. And maybe the do part is to go back and thank God for forgiveness and really, and really truly believe that you're forgiven. I don't know which one it is for you, but I would just, just challenge you to go through and just evaluate based on what you heard today, what do you believe? And because you believe it, what will you do this week to put it on display? And see what God might do as the Spirit works with you and in you. Let me pray for you. I think this is a, a message we need to hear daily. I don't think this is a, should be a one-time only. I think we need to go back over and over again and just review, God, what do I believe? What do I believe? Help me in my unbelief. Help me in the areas that I'm struggling. Even though I say I know, help me, God, to truly believe today. So let me pray for you today. Father God, I thank you for those who this moment are hearing this message. And I pray, God, that uh, together we lift up the sorrow and the hurt of the tragedy of the murders of these children and teachers in Texas, God. May you lift up their families. May you use this uh, as a place of comfort for those who are perhaps know you well and a drawing to you for those who are far from you, God. God, help us in our unbelief. I pray that for those who are listening, that if there's an area of unbelief, an area that, they, that we've proclaimed we believe, but there's no evidence in our life, God, that we would pursue you and ask you to help us so we could see this truth, not only playing out in ourselves, but also to see it for the benefit of our others who are watching. We love you, God. We give you glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me. I hope to see you guys next time.